This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Welcome to Beijing, the strong, fast-beating heart of the Chinese prosperity. I mean, who doesn't love it here, right? Here you see history, you see modernity. Uh, it's great for sports lovers, it's great for nature lovers. In fact, Beijing is great for anyone who wants to make life here. For decades, Beijing has been known as a safe and stable city free from natural calamities but not the summer of 2023. First, there was the heat. Beijing experienced this unprecedented and rare heat wave that left residents and visitors flabbergasted. The city known for its continental climate with distinct seasons witnessed an extraordinary surge in temperatures that exceeded previous records. Throughout the season, the mercury soared with daily highs consistently hitting over 40 degrees Celsius. Then came the rain. It was around 10 when the water suddenly surged in. If you can see that bridge over there, it was overwhelmed immediately. And people were asking why. What do you make of all these events? To what extent is all these due to climate change? Without climate change, we wouldn't see so many uh, these kind of extreme events. A year ago, you were uh, having very hot and dry summer in in China, and and now we have been you have also been breaking all time high temperature record in western part of your country, and we have been uh, injecting more carbon dioxide to the atmosphere by burning fossil fuels and. Uh, that's why we have started seeing more often heat waves. Oh my gosh, look at the harbor. Scientists say the historic town and much of Maui faced an increased risk for wildfires. We gotta walk somewhere over there by the beach. No! Yes! The car! As Beijing's recovered from the other side of the globe, some horrible but similar trend is echoing what happened here. I just get out and drive off. I finally on the seawall by French Street. So I get out of there and went to the water because it's getting worse and the fire is getting worse. The flame is too hot. So I jump in the water and secure myself there. You know, it's going to break our family apart. Because this is a kid park where the kids would play, and you don't know where kids would run for safety at that point. So we're, we're searching everything. We're turning over every rock, every, every limb. Uh, you know, we need to figure out a way to help a lot of people in the next several years and to build some of these um, structures. Climate scientists use the term billion-dollar disaster to identify disasters that cause damages exceeding that amount. In 2023, the U.S. broke another record with 25 separate events so far. Through the first nine months of 2023, there have been billion dollar weather or climate related disasters across the United States. Floods, wildfire, drought, hurricanes, tornado hail and high wind events, um, even winter storm events. So the United States has really had quite a historic uh, year so far in terms of these weather and climate extremes. Over in the Eastern Caribbean on the island of St. Lucia, an island whose economy depends heavily on tourism, rising sea levels are making locals suffer. 
when the tide is high, and it makes it impossible sometimes to open the restaurant. The sea would rage and run right through there and through the entrance. We would get sand up to four to six feet high in the restaurant. Meanwhile, climate issues have brought a fresh challenge to the African continent and it's gone beyond climate. We are now finding lily mosquitoes in areas where we never found them before. Um, but also we find them in areas that have been cleared of malaria. So that's quite concerning um, because that's not our normal malaria control areas. If extreme weather is a global concern, the burden is not equally shared. For some, Noah's Ark seems to be sinking faster. When that happens irreversibly, the only chance left for many is to leave. Nos hemos visto bastante, bastante afectados con el tema de la migración. Incluso yo, yo emigré, yo emigré eh, yendo en ese viaje eh, también se murió un amigo enfrente de mí. Eh, si sí hay algunos que se, que se han muerto por causa de migración. As UNICEF Executive Director Catherine Russell once said, moving may have saved their lives, but it's also very disruptive. Statistics on internal displacement caused by climate disasters generally do not account for the age of the victims. But UNICEF worked to reveal the hidden toll on children. And we found, so looking at the past displacements, that there were 43.1 million internal displacements of children due to weather-related events over that six-year period, which is the equivalent to about 20,000 child displacements every day. As if it wasn't heart-wrenching enough, Healy warns that the data only reveals the tip of the iceberg. This is how United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres summed it up. Humanity has opened the gates of hell. Horrendous heat is having horrendous effects. If nothing changes, we are heading towards a 2.8 degree temperature rise, towards a dangerous and unstable world. This photo was taken in 2019. The UN Secretary General chose to warn humanity of the trouble we've brought upon ourselves by making this time cover. Four years on, the sad truth is that we have not turned things any better. Now the question is, should we lose hope and give up? A quick answer is no. Let's rewind. Back in the 1970s, pessimistic views and predictions about climate change painted a bleak future for mankind. Scientists and experts warned of catastrophic consequences, even the end of humanity. Many of them fortunately did not come true. Even if we couldn't solve all the problems, we've been scrambling for ways to delay some of them from happening thanks to two things, political will and technology. Political will, as shown just days before by the China-U.S. landmark Sunnyland Statement ahead of the two leaders meeting in San Francisco. In the possibly most significant gesture of cooperation between these two largest economies, they have decided to operationalize their climate action working group to engage in dialogue and cooperation to accelerate concrete climate actions. This will focus on energy transition, methane, and other non-carbon greenhouse gas emissions the circular economy and resource efficiency, subnational cooperation among states, provinces, and cities, forest regeneration, and basically supporting the work of COP28. This has been uh, actually an active partnership for quite a long time, in spite of, of much of the uh, conflict that you hear about. There's actually a, a good collaboration on many climate agenda items, and, and for the U.S. And, and China to tackle particularly methane, which is a, a big issue uh, globally, uh, one that's manageable and a very serious greenhouse gas pollutant uh, will help all of us to, to elevate our own games to tackle that. This is really fantastic news for the world, the two largest emitters coming together uh, with some really concrete strategies to address some of the major issues related to our environment, climate, and air pollution. And looking back a bit further, the Kyoto Protocol made concrete how big emitters should take the lead in slowing climate change. It created the first binding targets to limit emissions. 
The Paris Agreement made another major breakthrough in strengthening the global response to climate change by keeping a global temperature rise this century well below 2 degrees Celsius. It also pursues efforts to limit the temperature increase even further to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And China has walked the talk. Chinese I think that China's decision to build no new coal plants overseas has huge implications for the global climate transition. If all of them would have been built, we might see uh, the world rising by 2.7 degrees temperature increase by the end of this century. This announcement is actually the best news for the climate since the Paris Agreement. Good news and decisions made their way to reality through down-to-earth efforts, sometimes down to sand. Because China has one of the world's largest decertified areas, Sanbei, or the Three North, the Northwest, North, and Northeast regions in China is home to deserts, including the Gobi Desert. In 1978, the country launched the Three North Shelter Belt Forest Program, or TSFP project. Over the past four decades, the program has increased forest area by over 30 million hectares nationwide. In June 2023, at the front line of curbing desertification, the city of Bayanur in Inner Mongolia Autonomous Region had a special guest. President Xi Jinping was there on a fact-finding mission on how China has been turning deserts into lucid waters and lush mountains. Behind the saga are stories of ordinary people. Well, they can be heroes. <laughs> No one knows the desert better than 78-year-old Jia. He still remembers how astonished he was when he first saw it. He was in his teens then and later started to plant trees in the newly built Qinghua Forest Farm. It took people like Jia six decades to change the landscape. They developed a set of forestation approaches, scientific seedling techniques, as well as methods to improve afforestation that fit the local ecosystem. They planted a whopping 4.3 million saplings. Today, the area of sandy land has been reduced to a quarter compared to that 60 years ago. Forest coverage has increased to 65%. Still, sand prevention and control is a long-term task, and the new generation is ready. Not only because they love and respect their fathers, but because they care about the future, the future for every father, mother, and child. From transforming deserts to clean up the air to developing new technology, shifting energy structure, and raising public awareness on a healthier lifestyle. Everything done to cultivate a more sustainable cycle of nature. To pay off previous ecological debts, avoid new debts, and strive to save our planet in more creative ways, that's where the future of mankind lies in. And today, you know, renewable energy is very cheap. It's in many places competitive with coal. You know, the price of uh, concentrated solar, the price of PV, the price of wind, which used to be more expensive because there was less of it and a lot of innovation, R&D had to be done. But now it's actually competitive. In Europe, there has been a significant focus on low-carbon efforts. 
governments, organizations, and individuals. Europeans have reached an agreement on the urgent need to reduce emissions and combat climate change. There is a growing trend of consuming locally sourced, organic, and plant-based foods, which helps lower emissions related with food industry. Sustainable transportation options have gained popularity too. The Netherlands has more than 35,000 kilometers of cycled paths. How long is that? It is a quarter of the country's total road network. France has already banned short-haul domestic flights for routes already serviced by rail. In the case of Iceland, a way to keep emissions low is by making use of what normally would go to waste, by reusing methane to fuel public transport. Northern Rocka uses methane gas on all of their cars, and the municipality also participates in the project by using methane gas in their infrastructure for example, in public transportation. And this is very important for a project like this one when we are still creating and building up the market. Nordrorka has been processing methane gas since 2014 from an old landfill site. The, the volumes of renewable energy that China is currently deploying have totally surpassed everybody's expectations, including China's expectations. Targets for 2030 are already expected to be met in 2025. And those were only set a few years ago. And in the latest climate agreement reached by China and the United States, the two countries have made it clear that they will pursue efforts to triple renewable energy capacity globally by 2030. That growth should reach levels high enough so as to accelerate the substitution for coal, oil, and gas generation. So there has been broad progress, but still the window of opportunity is closing. Many scientists believe that a strong El Nino combined with global warming could be a double whammy for the climate next year. So we're anticipating that not only is 2023 going to be exceptionally warm and possibly um, uh, a record warm year, uh, but we anticipate that 2024 will be warmer still. Well, it tells us that we're running out of time, but we're not running out of options. And there is an opportunity. The prescriptions are there. We know what needs to be done. We know who needs to do it. And we know when that needs to be done. We know that there is a significant portfolio, both on the mitigation side, on the adaptation side of the solutions that are required to address this major deficit. What's still lacking is a political will to engage and the political will to implement those prescriptions. Here is the thing. Developed countries are responsible for most of the heat-trapping emissions since the Industrial Revolution. On the other hand, developing countries have lower emissions, but they're still bearing the brunt of a hotter climate. Promises from some of the world's biggest economies haven't been panning out. Many are years behind schedule, or still years away from sending money. Delayed by political deadlock, bureaucratic hurdles, and debates over new rules to expedite aid from development banks and private donors. And injustice burns at the heart of the climate crisis, and this flame is scorching hopes and possibilities as world leaders are warning. Developed countries must commit to reaching net zero emissions as close as possible to 2040. And they must also keep their promise to provide 100 billion US dollars a year to developing countries. We did make a deliberate, intentional decision as a country to chart the way towards a much more sustainable future, both for ourselves and globally. And it, it has continuously informed Kenya's position. We are part of the, start co the first conference of parties that started the journey towards what we have today as the COP space. We have made contributions in the space around environment and habitats and it speaks to what we believe in as a country and as a people. O mundo está precisando de uma governança global mais forte, sobretudo quando se trata de discutir dois temas, a paz e a questão climática. Se você não tiver um conselho de segurança da ONU com autoridade de decidir e os países signatários cumprirem, a gente não vai resolver o problema climático no mundo. The notion that we can preserve global public goods 
only with public money, ignores the fact that we have seen for the last 50 years the absolute dominance of the capitalist markets leading to a consolidation of wealth and hence the ability to be able to play their role must, must be summoned by the rest of us. We cannot continue to put the interests of a few before the lives, the lives of many. How to make sure that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts? Are we all pulling in the same direction? Here's U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen's proposal at the new Global Financing Pact Summit in June. MDBs need to evolve to incorporate addressing these global challenges into their work. This includes reforming their vision, incentive structures, their operating model, and financing capacity to help countries fight these challenges and build resilience. I hope we can really achieve that. Although our memory of 2020 is still fresh, when then U.S. President Donald Trump withdrew from the Paris Agreement. Plus, discourse on climate change has shifted from a purely environmental lens to a political and ideological tool. In Western countries, the subject is now so divisive that even the words climate change are now deemed controversial. The current climate talks feels more like a game of chess rather than a global partnership. So, what's next? Will climate change be the next north-south divide? Polluters versus non-polluters? Will new blocks emerge on the basis of climate allegiance? If money is the nerve of war, this war against climate change and global warming needs leadership and it needs a vision. If multilateralism can prove its value, it takes the leadership of China, it takes the leadership of the United States, of the EU, and in fact, the rest of the world to give it their best shot. And it is limited time offered. China is the largest global uh, emitter and action taken, whether it's negative, whether it's positive, really moves the needle. So there have been some significant init initiatives there, developments in solar, developments in wind, developments in other alternative energies, which will, are making a difference. The question though is the, the scale of the change, this shift, this transition from fossil fuels to renewables is on a, such a massive scale. According to the World Bank, without China successfully transitioning to a low carbon economy, achieving global climate goals will be impossible. China emits 27% of global carbon dioxide and a third of the world's greenhouse gases. This transition will require a massive shift in resources, innovation, and new technologies to raise energy efficiency and resource productivity. This has opened new avenues not only for China, but other climate vulnerable countries. China, largely, but also India, has brought down the price of solar energy by 90%. Well, that's the best help you can give to Malawi or Madagascar, the poorest nations in the world, because it means that they can buy the solar energy by their own means. To make that happen, China's energy system had to undergo a complete overhaul due to the need to sharply reduce coal consumption in a short period. China aims to increase the share of non-fossil energy in total consumption from 15.3% in 2019 to about 25% by 2030. So, it was also a case of a ship-in or ship-out for carbon-intensive industries, coal-fired power stations, and gas-puzzling vehicles. Just some 10 years ago, Chinese-made electric vehicles were taken as a joke, even by open-minded persons like Elon Musk. Although there's competitors now ramping up, and yeah. as you're familiar with BYD, which is also on the West Coast, I think they're ramping up production of their electric vehicles. Uh, Warren <laughs> Buffett owns 10% stake in that. Uh, why do you laugh? BYD <laughs> is trying to compete. Why do you laugh? Have you seen their car? I have seen their car, <laughs> yes. In fact, at the Berkshire Hathaway meeting, I saw their cars. Yeah. 
Well, they are on a different. <laughs> they are on a different. Tell me Sorry. why you're laughing. Um. You don't see them at all as a competitor. No. Let's check out how is BYD doing 12 years later. Warren Buffett was right when he bought a 10% stake in BYD Auto in 2008. He said that they would one day become the largest player in a global automobile market that was inevitably going electric. On which Musk had to say something else. That was many years ago. The cars are highly competitive these days. The point is, this is not only a saga of a car brand. Chinese-made EVs are seen as the most impressive part of the country's energy transformation process. According to Bloomberg, EVs accounted for a quarter of all passenger cars sold in China in 2022. The rate in the U.S. is roughly 1 in 7 and in Europe, 1 in 8. HSBC expects EVs could represent more than 50% of domestic sales by the end of 2025 and as much as 90% by 2030. How did China achieve that? Through tax breaks, a lot of infrastructure, to name some of the methods. Simple logic. The goal is to make buying and owning EVs more and more appealing. Same logic for other industries. And China's economy turned the corner in a short time and is now hailed as a model of low-carbon development by many. China's know-how for deploying sustainable projects is being shared abroad. There are over 500 renewable energy facilities in 83 countries with Chinese partnership today. This cooperation can even be seen in Saudi Arabia's The Red Sea Mega City Project. And in the United Arab Emirates, host to Top 28, among other sustainable projects, Chinese firms and the local government are constructing the world's largest solar plant. Donc vous êtes sur le projet Aldafra, qui est la plus grande centrale solaire du monde. Donc c'est un projet qui a commencé à produire ses premiers kilowattheures fin d'année dernière et qui devrait à terme produire 2,1 gigawatts. Donc 2,1 gigawatts, ça permettra demain de proposer de l'énergie décarbonée à 160 000 foyers. This is certainly not the end of the story. If you go traveling across the world, you see various projects like this. China has already made great strides, but climate change being a global issue, only a global approach can translate in concrete outcomes. We appreciate that uh, China is investing in renewable energy. It's demonstrable the journey you have made towards you know, making a contribution and a big one towards the road to renewable energy. China has made a contribution towards assisting the world to come up with interventions, infrastructure, equipment, technology that support climate action and climate solutions, including uh, green energy. Let's find a pathway forward on climate. I'm optimistic because of my job to be optimistic that at COP28 we will see a degree of forward movement because we must.